Hello, everyone. All right, today we're going to talk about um, the atmosphere, specifically the basics and components of the atmosphere. We'll look into some weather and wind patterns, um, Hadley cells, and we'll finish it off with El Nino. So let's get started. All right, well, the first main thing that you may be thinking is what is in the air, right? I mean, the air around us is composed of a lot of different things, but the two main elements that you can find in the atmosphere are nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen composes 78% of the atmosphere and oxygen takes up about 21%. The last remaining 1% or so are called the trace gases, and those include things like hydrogen, carbon dioxide, argon, etc. cetera. Uh, the atmosphere is layered, so we're gonna go through all the different layers that you can find in the atmosphere. And the whole main function of the atmosphere is to pretty much protect us from solar radiation, so stuff coming from the sun, and in essence, in doing so, it keeps the planet warm. So here's a nice little um, visual representation of what the atmosphere is made of. So you can see 78% is nitrogen, 21% is oxygen, and the rest are trace gases. So if you want to look at what is the majority of the trace gases, that would be CO2. And then we have hydrogen, krypton, methane, helium, neon, argon, etc. So those are the main components of the atmosphere. All right, and then this is what I was talking about. The atmosphere is layered. So we're gonna go through and discuss each layer here. You have the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. And as you go up, there are different characteristics with each of them that you must know. So let's start with the first layer, which is the one that we're in, that is the troposphere. Um, how do I kind of remember this? Well, it's the one we live in. And so here we experience weather. So that exists in the troposphere. Um, it goes from about zero to 10 to 15 kilometers up into the air. And so if you want to convert that into miles, because we're here in America, that would be about when you run a 10K, that's what, six miles? So zero to six miles up into the air. Now, an interesting thing is as you go up into the troposphere, the temperatures actually drop. You may have experienced this if you've ever been on a plane. You go on a plane, you reach your cruising um, altitude, and you touch the window of the plane. You'll notice that it's quite colder than what it was down on the surface of the Earth. So um, that just kind of shows you that as you go up, the temperatures actually drop. They get colder. Something that happens here in the troposphere is something called a temperature inversion, or you might see it mentioned as a thermal inversion. A temperature inversion is when um, pretty much the temperatures are flip-flopped in the troposphere. So what do I mean by that? Well, in normal conditions, uh, you have your cold air on top and your warm air below, right? So down on the surface of Earth, we're generating a lot of heat, and then it rises, and as it rises, it gets colder. Okay, that's normal, like normal conditions. But in an inversion, what you have happen is those conditions get flip-flopped. So the cold air is actually on the bottom, and the warm air sits on top. Now, why is that a problem? Well, cold air is much more dense than warm air. And so if it's dense, it sits, and it can actually trap pollutants down at the surface of the area, making it pretty toxic to humans. There is a very famous thermal inversion event that happened in history, and it happened in London in 1952. It's called the London Smog Event. Um, in this event, they had a thermal inversion that hit London, and because the cold air was trapping so many pollutants, it led to many deaths. Unfortunately, um, because it was so cold, the people of London, they kept burning coal. That was their main energy source. Well, when you burn coal, you do release a lot of pollutants into the air. So it was making the situation worse because um, they were trying to stay warm, but then it was adding pollutants in the air and the cold air was trapping those pollutants down near the surface. Here's some other pictures from the London smog event. You can see it was not very clear in the atmosphere. 
All right, something else that happens in the troposphere is called the urban heat island effect. And this happens in urban areas such as Los Angeles, where we are at. Um, it is a phenomenon where the, uh, if you're looking at an area of land, the areas that are urbanized do warm up quite significantly compared to the surrounding areas. Well, how does that happen? Like, how does downtown Los Angeles get so much hotter than somewhere outside of like a suburb of Los Angeles? Well, that is uh, because there's a number of things that cause that. Number one, the skyscrapers that are in downtown Los Angeles, they actually block the movement of wind. And so you don't get that cooling off effect from wind patterns that go through the city. Um, two, a lot of the materials in urban areas, they are made of asphalt or concrete. And those things are really good at trapping heat and absorbing it. So it makes the area much warmer. Um, in downtown Los Angeles, a lot of the streets are, you know, asphalt, they're black. And so black, as you know, absorbs a lot of the heat in the area. So those are just a couple of reasons why urban areas tend to be a lot warmer. And take a look at this graph. You can see that um, over a period of a day, the urban areas do absorb much more heat than you would say, oh, a desert area. And again, why is that? Well, desert areas, they don't have a lot of things that are absorbing the heat. And so um, you compare that to an urban city, they do. All right, our second layer is the stratosphere. And the stratosphere is above the troposphere. It goes from about 10 to 50 kilometers into the air. Now, what's interesting about the stratosphere is as you go up in the stratosphere, the temperatures actually get warmer. And that is because of a lovely molecule that we have in the stratosphere called ozone, stratospheric ozone. Now, what is the main job of this ozone? probably already know this, it's to absorb UV radiation from the sun. Specifically, ozone, which is a molecule made of just three oxygens, it is really good at absorbing UVB and UVC rays. Okay, so in absorbing that heat energy from the sun, it actually makes the layer warmer. Um, it's great that we have this ozone layer because it does act as a shield. It absorbs a lot of that UV radiation that could make it down to the surface of Earth. Um, we'll talk more about why UV radiation is so bad in future lectures. All right, the third and fourth layer are the mesosphere and the thermosphere. Um, the mesosphere goes from about 50 kilometers to 80 kilometers up into the atmosphere. And as you go up, it's the temperatures fall again. And that is because there's not a lot of particles in the mesosphere that are absorbing any of the sunlight. So it's actually a very cold um, layer. The last one is the thermosphere. And the thermosphere, as you go up it, the temperatures get warmer again. And that's because it is closest to the sun. Um, so it goes from about 80 to 40, 480 kilometers up. Now you see this graphic here. I would definitely memorize it. I have seen it pop up before on AP tests. Um, you should definitely know that when you start at the troposphere, it goes from warm to cold, stratosphere cold to warm, mesosphere warm to cold, and then thermosphere cold to warm. So it kind of goes back and forth as you move up through the atmosphere. Now this is something that also exists in our atmosphere, the in-between layers. So the in-between layers are called pauses, and they tend to be areas of pretty stable conditions. Um, so for example, if you wanted to look at the in-between layer between the troposphere and the stratosphere, we call that the tropopause. Okay, and then if you want to look at the stratosphere to the mesosphere, the in-between area, that's called the stratopause. So just throwing that out to you guys. And there's that image again that I would highly suggest you memorize. So this brings us to how are things like winds and air currents created? All right, well, it all has to do with the sun, of course. So as you know, the earth is round and the sun is hitting you know, our earth. Well, it hits more directly at the equator. 
okay? And so because of that, the air at the equator is heated faster or warmer than the other surrounding areas. So that air is getting heated. Now again, the philosophy of all this is that heat rises. So when it rises, it kind of cools and it will settle into a circulation pattern. So the heat rises, it cools, and then falls. And then it creates this giant cycle we call a Hadley cell. This kind of explains also why deserts can be found at 30 degrees north and south of the equator, because those descending air currents are coming off and they're extremely dry. Okay, um, so the movement of this air from hot to cold is what creates our wind currents. Now, air, because it gets heated and cooled, will have different densities. And so if you talk about air pressure, it's pretty much how much force is being put on an area of land. Um, cold air is more dense than warm air, so cold air is heavier than warm air. And when you get the mixing of the two, you get what are called winds. And when a wind is created, it also has the ability to move any water that is near it. So that kind of is what creates our water currents, is wind pushing the water in certain directions. Um, what helps with those directions? Well, it's something, a process called the Coriolis effect. Okay, so because the earth is spinning, right, we're, we're spinning, um, anything that is moving will actually get deflected, okay, depending upon what hemisphere you're in. So imagine you're standing at the equator and you're trying to throw something towards the pole or vice versa. Because the earth is spinning, you're going to see a deflection of that object. Well, what is deflected? Well, the water and the wind that is here on Earth. So if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, things get deflected to the right of the equator. And if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, things get deflected to the left of the equator. That is simply because the Earth is spinning and we call that the Coriolis effect. All right, so here's kind of a picture of all of the Earth's major currents that are created from the movement of wind and water here on Earth. Our early um, voyagers, they knew that. They would know to pick up on the currents and it would take them to different locations with ease because they could go with the currents. The last thing we're gonna talk about that does give students some problems is El Nino or the El Nino Southern Oscillation, also called ENZO. I've seen that on the AP test. So what is ENZO? Well, let's first talk about what is normal, okay? So normally you get heated water along the equator because again, the equator is the most direct point to the sun. So you get heated water more so than you do at the poles. Okay, so water is heated at the equator. All right, in normal conditions, what you have happen is winds are created and they push that heated water around the Pacific. So if you imagine the Pacific Ocean, here in Los Angeles, we are the East Pacific. And over here you have like China, Asia, that's the West Pacific. So in normal conditions, the winds carry the heated water from East Pacific to West Pacific. Well, in an El Nino year, those winds stop. So instead of getting the movement of the hot water over here, the water, the hot water stays over here on the East Pacific. So why is that a problem? Well, you probably know when you heat water, what does it do? It rains, right? It'll evaporate and then precipitate. So if that hot water stays over on the East Pacific, then we get a lot of rain that was supposed to be making it towards the West Pacific. Um, El Nino happens every three to eight years and it usually only happens in the winter time. Um, scientists still don't quite know why the, the trade winds that are supposed to carry the water over, why do they stop? That's still being investigated, but they do know that it happens in the winter and El Nino was actually given that name by the Peruvians because they're the ones that noticed it because their fisheries would collapse. And we'll talk a little bit how that happens in a second. But they noticed it was around winter time, around Christmas, so they named it El Nino, which means like, you know, little baby Jesus, little baby. Yeah. Okay, so what are some of the effects of El Nino? So like, why is it 
harmful in certain areas? Well, the first thing is when you don't have the water moving, you lose this cycle that happens in the water called upwelling. And that's really important that you get the warm water to move out and it's replaced with cold water because the cold water contains a lot of nutrients. If you stop the movement of that water, those nutrients don't come up. And so you have a lot of organisms that were depending on those nutrients, they can't get them. And so it leads to um, a lot of deaths in marine organisms. In California, for example, when we get an El Nino year, there's tons of rain, tons, tons, tons of rain. And so it might not be all that bad, but as you know, rains can lead to things like mudslides, erosion, um, house destruction. We have a lot of houses built along the coast. And so you do get some that are accidentally get put into the ocean, um, but it's a significant amount of rain. I remember, the really, really, really big El Nino we had um, was in 1997, and it was my first year of college, so I'm kind of dating myself right there. But they actually canceled classes at Santa Barbara for two days because the rain was just nonstop. You couldn't even get out of the dorms and make it to the class. So like a good college student, I spent those two days studying, right? Yes, studying. All right, what's also kind of neat in California is that because the ocean water is warmer, you see the migration of tropical species into warmer areas like our coast. Usually when you go out in the water in the Pacific, it's pretty cold. Um, I usually have to wear some sort of wetsuit, but in an El Nino year, the ocean temperatures are definitely warmer. And so tropical species of fish, marine organisms, they tend to migrate into our areas because their range of tolerance is, um, is suitable for them now. And so this is actually a fish that was caught in one of those, the 1997 El Nino. And you can tell that's definitely a tropical species of fish. We do not have those here. Um, in South America, they experience the same sort of effects that we get in California because that warm water is still in the East Pacific. So they get a lot of rain, which leads to massive flooding, property damage, mudslides. They also have some of their fisheries collapsing. For example, in Peru, they have a really big anchovy fishery. And when there are no more nutrients in the water or they're not being cycled, the fisheries collapse because those fish aren't getting enough nutrients. You also see um, the production of typhoons that happen in El Nino years because the water is a lot warmer. The typhoon is just a hurricane on the Pacific side. Uh, coral bleaching also happens. That's when the coral pretty much dies. Remember, coral is very sensitive to heat. So when you heat up the water, it may cause um, the death of the organism. In Australia, so Australia and countries like that are on the West Pacific, so they are being deprived of the water that should have moved that way with the winds. So you can imagine if they're not getting the precipitation, they are experiencing extreme drought. Okay, so they get huge dust bowl storms, um, organisms dying because they don't have enough water. So usually the next season, the trade winds will pick up and they will move the water towards the West Pacific. So then what happens, usually the year after an El Nino, you get what's called a La Nina event. And um, in that, what happens is the trade winds pick up and what is replacing that warm water that was sitting at the equator is extremely cold water that's coming and circulating off the poles. So in a La Nina year, you kind of get the opposite effects. You have really, really cold water. Okay, so number one, there's a lot of nutrients, a lot of life that will happen. However, there's going to be a very little precipitation. There's no rain. And that is because the water is much colder than it was in the warmer El Nino years. Um, and then usually the next year after that, things will get back to normal. And then three to eight years later, you'll have another El Nino event. Well, I hope that was helpful in introducing you to the atmosphere and some of the things that occur in the atmosphere. Um, thank you so much, you guys, for watching.